Hi, I'm Doug Scockle. I want to welcome you to another uh, YouTube video session. I've got a good uh, topic for you here today. It's entitled uh, How to Win 80% of Your Close Games. And that's exactly what our teams have done over the last 40 plus years that I've been a coach. Uh, nine years as a high school boys coach, uh, 30, a little over 30 years as a college men's coach, and in retirement, the last six years, uh, I've been a skill development coach in a college uh, women's program as well. So. Uh, the topic, uh, I, I think, is it, it may be one of the most important things. I go to, when I go to coaching clinics, a lot of times uh, people are trying to find out, you know, what are the, why do you win? Why do, you, why do your programs win so much? You know, we won 15 conference championships uh, over that period of time. I uh, had a state championship team in high school, state runner-up team in high school in two different states. Um, you know, we won 10 college conference championships and, and national tournament trips and so on. And so what are the things that really set, the, you know, that uh, set you apart that allow you to accomplish those things? And I think today's topic is one of the biggest reasons why. We uh, kept track, and as I said earlier, uh, we, we've won 80% of our close games over that uh, entire uh, span of, of, co of, our, of my coaching career. So I want to share with you uh, exactly, you know, why that is, because it's not an accident. Okay, it's, it's something very carefully planned. and. And I want to show you how to stack the deck in, in your favor. You know, law of averages would say you'd win 50% uh, of your games over that period of time. But because we put so much emphasis uh, on uh, uh, practicing uh, late game situations, uh, we have a significant advantage. Uh, we practice late game situations every day in practice, from the first day of practice to the last day and I'm talking about every day we never take a day off and so by the time you get to the end of the season we may have you know 50 60 or more uh, close game experiences under our belt and that's that's great for the coach or for the for the players because uh, the, the, they tend to make better and better decisions and for you as a coach you'll find that not only will you make better decisions in a late game situation but you'll make them quicker and as you stockpile the, these experiences, and we used to ask our players uh, at the beginning of the year when I was a college coach, we'd get players to come in as freshmen, and of course some, maybe some Division One transfers uh, and uh, uh, some junior college transfers, and I'd, I'd say, show of hands in your previous program, how many, how many of you practiced the you know, the last minute or two minutes of a game every day in practice? And in all my years of coaching, I never had one player raise his hand. So. What I told our players is, and that's going to be our advantage because nobody else in the country is going to work at this as hard as we do. So we get in those last uh, two minutes of a game, we're going to be uh, so much better prepared, so much more experienced than anybody else that we play. Um, I ran a, a basketball camp at uh, Mesa State College. That was a Division II school where I spent 30 years in Grand Junction, Colorado. And uh, over the course of eight weeks of camps, uh, coaches would come in and very, invariably we'd have this conversation. I'd say, Coach, uh, how was your season? they say, oh, Coach Scockle, uh, man, uh, we were so close. We, uh, you know, we were 11 and 12, we were a little under 500, but we lost five games by a total of 13 points. And, you know, so my thought was immediately, I didn't say this to the, to the coach, but my thought immediately was, wow, what if they'd won 80% of those five losses? How, how you know could that impact a season? I want you to think about this. Let's take that 11 and 12 season and let's let them win because they've worked on it and deserve it that they win four of those five games. Well, suddenly you go from 11 and 12 to 15 and 8. That is a significant difference. But here's what else happens when you're 15 and 8. You think you start thinking you're a pretty good, a pretty good team, and suddenly you win one or two other games because you think of yourself as a good team. <clears throat> and so instead of 15 and 8, now you're 16 and 7 or, or uh, 17 and 6, whatever the case may be. So, I mean, it's, it's very impactful. I mean, it really, you know, makes a, makes a huge difference. Um, our 1994-95 uh, Rocky Mountain Athletic Conference Championship team at Mesa State uh, had a very unique season. We, 18 of our 19 games were decided by single digits. Okay, single-digit margin of victory, 18 of the 19 games. And because of we won you know, such a high percentage, as I mentioned, we did win the championship. So what I want to do now is get into the, the whys and the wheres of, of how we uh, practice this type of thing. 
And here's the first thing that I, that, that, that I found over the years that became very clear to me that 80% of all close games are lost, not won. So I want to make sure that you understand that. Someone on the losing team, one or more than one players, will make some kind of mistake, and often it's a mental mistake. They, they made a bad choice. And it opened the, you know, just opened the door and allowed the other team to slip in and, and, and be victorious. So that's the first thing that I tell my players at the beginning of every season is that 80% of all close games are lost, not won. We don't have to do anything heroic. Uh, you know, we don't have to have the, the last minute, uh, last second uh, ESPN highlight uh, shot to win the game or whatever it is. If we will just stay within our system and do what we do, You'll, you'll just simply uh, create a situation where you allow the other team then to mess up at some point and it opens the door for you to win. Um, we do have answers uh, for the other 20% of the time. We have uh, you know, last second plays, a, a, a series of those that we practice and rehearse and so when we get in a late game situation we don't go into a timeout uh, and I'm frantically diagramming plays and and uh, instead it's just a, it's a, simply a review of uh, what we you know of what we've done and uh, there's a tremendous amount of confidence uh, again that comes from this your, your players I mean they don't they, they would run into huddles and they go time and score baby uh, this is our this is our time and uh, that confidence uh, you know really goes a long ways um, I mentioned we you know we do have special plays I'll talk about a couple of those later in the in the video and, and as we uh, always told our players that you know those plays those situations don't guarantee victory but they do guarantee you a chance at victory I can't tell you how many times over the years uh, games I've been involved in or games where I've gone recruiting and, and, and watched high school games and so on where I've, I've seen uh, uh, you know, I had one year, I, I, I was uh, recruiting, a, and the only seat left in a packed gym was right behind the team um, that, that I was, uh, you know, I was looking at one of their players, and so I'm right behind there. Well, they get into the huddle with three seconds to go, and they're down two, and I'm watching the coach diagram a play, and I mean, it's a great play, and I'm making a mental note, I'm saying, oh, yeah, that's pretty good. I'm going to write that one down because uh, they're going to score and tie this thing up. But the coach is frantically diagramming the play, the team went out, and it was amazing, three of his five players went the wrong direction on the play. And they didn't even get a shot off. And it was just stunning. And then I, you know, and that's when I realized that, well, obviously that's the first time they'd ever seen that play was when it was diagrammed on the board. So again, we, we tried to take all the chance out of this situation. All right, so I want to talk to you about a thing that we do every day in practice called time and score. Now, um, I was really lucky in uh, 1964 when I started coaching a long time ago. But uh, there was a, they used to there weren't videos, there weren't DVDs or any of that kind of stuff. Uh, there were simply uh, uh, books, and so there was a thing called the Coach's Book Club. One of the very first books that I got was the book I'm holding up right now, called Winning Basketball Strategy by a guy named Glenn Wilkes, and. Um, it's probably one of the best things that ever happened to me because I began to look at all these late game scenarios and then I had an opportunity to, to listen to Morgan Wooten, the, the great uh, DeMatha uh, Catholic high school coach uh, and of course I had an opportunity to, to uh, watch and, and attend clinics uh, where Dean Smith was. These coaches also placed a premium on late game preparation and so what came out of that, I think the phrase time and score actually came from Morgan Wooten and so I want to tell you what it is. It's, it's basketball's version of football's two-minute drill. And what, what, what we do every day in practice, at the end of practice, we, we uh, rehearse scenarios uh, anywhere from two seconds to go to two minutes to go in a ball game. And uh, as I mentioned before, it's, just, it, it, it's such a great uh, confidence builder. But here's the other thing. So we play all these close games in practice. What happens is it helps you prevent that... Uh, and avoid that, that crushing, preventable uh, loss. And, and, and if you've been in coaching, and we've all had them, uh, and I've had them too, but not very many, but we've had them where uh, you had a crushing loss where somebody made a, uh, just a, a, a bad choice, a big mental mistake, and, and it allowed the other team to win the game. Well, I guarantee you that kid and your team and you won't ever forget that. But that's, to me, that's too high a price to pay. 
Okay, I don't want to pay the price of a loss of a basketball game when maybe I could have had that scenario come up in a practice and make that mistake. And we tell our players in these time and score situations, make all the mistakes you want. Make all the mistakes you want. And then we won't repeat them in a game. And so I think that's a, that, that's a really important thing. You know, the other thing that's kind of interesting, you know, once or twice a year, I have a player come into the locker room afterwards and go, Coach, can you believe it? Remember time and score on Wednesday? That was the exact situation that unfolded here in tonight's game. And uh, so, it's uh, again, it, it, it's exciting for us and, and uh, gives us a tremendous advantage. Uh, I want to give you a couple of good examples of uh, scenarios of, of uh, uh, opponents' mistakes. That uh, Again, I think these could have been uh, corrected in a, in a time and score situation. We were down at Western New Mexico University one year. And we are coming down the floor, we have, we have a one point deficit, we're down one, we're coming down the floor, getting ready to set up a last second play, with about eight or nine seconds to go, the Western New Mexico player makes a beautiful defensive play and just strips our point guard of the ball. Now he is racing to the other end of the floor. The clock is counting down, they have a one point lead, and you can see him begin to gather, he's going to put the exclamation point on their victory with a big dunk. But what happens is he dribbles the ball off his foot out of bounds, and there's two seconds remaining. We have had for years a, a, a beautiful uh, play we call the 94-foot play. We put our 94-foot play uh, into effect, and we score a layup at the buzzer to win by one point. Now, again, if this kid, all that kid had to do was dribble out the clock, and and uh, because we weren't, we didn't have anybody within 15 or 20 feet of him when he made the steal after he made the steal. Another example, we were at New Mexico Highlands University, and uh, they're in a situation where um, they are uh, um, trying to remember the scenario now exactly. They're up, uh, uh, they're up two. Uh, excuse me, they are up one, and they're shooting the second part of a, of a one on one. Okay, two seconds to go again. If the kid misses it. It's, they still have a one-point lead, and we really don't have time now to, to rebound the ball and advance it up. We didn't have any timeouts left either. And, uh, but instead, he makes the free throw. And we have rehearsed our 94-foot play enough that uh, we don't have to, uh, uh, we didn't need a timeout. Our kids knew where to go and what to do. We throw our 94-foot play in, we score at the buzzer, and then go on to win in overtime. Again, a time and score scenario. If he had intentionally missed the second free throw, we would have had no chance to win that game. All right, so how do we do it? Uh, our time and score. Here's what, here's what we do. We have a, we have a, sh a sheet, and actually this, this is the sheet, uh, a time and score sheet that we have uh, that's ready for every practice. But I've had it enlarged so it's easier to, so it's easier to see uh, for you and Josh. We may want to zoom in on, on some of these things uh, possibly, okay? But this is a sheet that is on the uh, score table and when the kids come in to uh, practice each day, one of the first things they do, uh, we take some dice, all right? And the first thing we're going to do is that we're going to roll dice, players going to roll dice to see how, how many fouls each one of those players is going to have when we get the time and score at the end of practice. So you can see right here uh, we've got players' names, the point guard, the two, the three, four, five. We've got two subs in here, and the foul. So they write in, right in here in this column. They write in, you know, each player rolls dice and, and puts the number of fouls he's got in there. We usually designate a captain for that day. He will roll the dice, and he'll put the number of timeouts uh, that they have uh, remaining right here. Okay, so up here in this corner, you can see we've got the number and the date. This was. Uh, uh, our 28th time and score situation on uh, December 9 uh, uh, of uh, 2014, for example. So, again, you can see down here, we talk about rolling dice. Obviously, you roll one through five. Uh, that's how many fouls you have. You roll six, you roll again. Uh, but if you have five fouls, then either you're going to switch teams or you're going to sit out and one of these subs is going to come up and take your place. Because in a late game situation, you know, a lot of times, I, I, in my early in my coaching career, I practice with my best players in late game situations. Then we get to the end of the game, and I have a kid fouled out, or maybe two kids fouled out, and I hadn't worked with those other players. So uh, this is—it's it, all a random uh, situation right here. And then, as far as timeouts, if you roll a one or a four, you say you have one timeout remaining. If you roll a two or five, you got two timeouts remaining. A three is 
You have three timeouts, you roll six, you have no timeouts. All right? So now here's our today's uh, uh, game. We've got the maroon team is trailing uh, by one point against the gold. The maroon team uh, with Bo Smith is going to shoot a, a one free throw. With, and then we got a, a minute and twenty. We got a, a minute and uh, twenty-two seconds remaining in the game. All right. So then we let me set this down. Um, so then we play the game out. Now there's a, there's another factor in here. Um, I had a I had a ball game well oh, many many years ago. We were in overtime. It was when I was a high school coach. We were in overtime, and I had a I had a guy. One of my players was standing no farther than from me to where the camera is right now, with his back to me, one of my players. I'm screaming as loud as I can to get his attention, and he can't hear me. And so uh, after that, what I did is I went to a local, uh, uh, our, our play-by-play -play guy on the radio, I went to him and I said, hey, can you make up a, a, a tape of crowd noise for me? And so he did, and he gave me, he gave me a, a, a tape uh, um, uh, with about uh, 20, 25 minutes of, cr of crowd noise on it. So when we do this time and score, we, you know, we recognize at the end of the practice, we will put this crowd noise on the on the PA system and crank it up to about nine, and you can't even hear yourself think. I mean, it's just it, it, it's incredible. But what it does is it, it vastly improves player to player communication and player to coach communication. And of course, you've got to be prepared to have you know maybe some hand signals or something, but. Uh, but but that, that it's a it's a real important thing, and I call it, it it's the confusion factor. And maybe you're never going to be in in a gym with uh, you know with that uh, kind of noise and that kind of confusion. But the, the fact that it just you know, enhances and improves the the eye contact and, and the player to player and coach to player communication is is well worth it. Um, all right, so we'll play out the scenario then. I have uh, again. Let me refer back to here, all right? But uh, down here you'll see in-game notes, and then here you'll see post-game notes, all right? So I hand this sheet, all right? So I'm gonna hand this sheet to our student, uh, to our student manager, and it, what happens is as, as the scenario, as the game plays out, if something happens, say 52 seconds ago, John Jones, you know, made a, a, a uh, not a good, uh, not a good decision. I'll turn to the manager. I'll say, 52 seconds ago, John Jones, blah blah blah, whatever it is. Now, in the early years, I would stop the play and point out John's error. Uh, but then I, I began to see that wasn't game like, and so I wanted to make sure that uh, we made it more game like. And I really wanted, I was hoping that John Jones' mistake would cost his team the victory uh, in that time and score situation. So again, it'd be another, you know, really good lesson learned. And so uh, we would play that situation out, and then as soon as we were done, we shut off the crowd noise. We would gather the center jump circle, and I'd sit the players down, and then I would take that sheet from the manager and I'd say, "Okay, uh, with 52 seconds to go, John, uh, you did such and such. What do you think would have been a better choice?" And I always like to ask the players rather than tell them because I want them to be engaged. All right? If John couldn't tell me, then I'd open it to the team. If the team couldn't tell me, then of course I would tell them what it was. If it was a scenario that the players or myself, if I didn't really know what I wanted to do in that situation, I'd tell the kids. I think that's important. I don't think you can try to bluff them. You don't try to, you know, I just say, you know what, I'm not sure what I want to do in that situation. Give me 24 hours, we'll talk about it tomorrow and I'll have an answer for you. So I think that's, you know, I think that's really important. Another thing is an option that we do is that, you know, we will coach in those time and score situations there's a timeout. We'll go into the huddle and coach the you know, coach the players and so on. But on certain days, we designate a player coach. And if there's a timeout, right, if, if you know, they'll determine if they're going to call timeout or not. All right. And so they will conduct the, the huddle. They'll talk about what they're going to do in the huddle. We'll go in the huddle and listen, uh, and maybe make some notes uh, on you know what they had to say. But again, it's another way just to get kids to to buy in, it's, and it's a pretty good situation for your for your team. Um, all right, so uh, after we do that, uh, uh, the other thing, that, again, that we do is that uh, we'll look at the different scenarios. And here's things that you need to look at. For example, you need to categorize scenarios that you need to, to, to practice in. And by the way, when we do these time and scores, I showed you, you know, what today's scenario was, but it could be anything. It's, you know, we're up, 
up one to three points, we're down one to three points, scores tied, their ball, our ball, shooting a free throw, balls got to go all the way through the 94 feet, go through a press, uh, it's uh, out of bounds under our own basket, under, out of bounds you know, on the sideline, uh, you know, you name it, we try to create all kinds of situations, then we just play them out. And it is amazing the number of weird and wild things that will come up. Uh, in your practices, things you couldn't, sometimes you can't even, you know, you couldn't even make the, make up some of the things that happen. But again, it's all part of this process, and, and as I said before, 80% of all close games are, are lost, not won. So again, we want to work on different uh, scenarios. So we want to take a look at uh, our come from behind strategy, all right? Use of timeouts. And I'm not going to get into all this stuff because it's just, it, there's way too much stuff in here, but you'll begin to create your own uh, uh, file, mental file, or actually a physical file of these kinds of scenarios. As I said, it's going to make you a better coach, and, and your kids are going to be better prepared. But so you know, use the timeouts, and I really, really do not like to use timeouts. Uh, I, if I can, I don't want to take any timeouts uh, before we get to, uh, let's say, the eight-minute mark of the ball of a basketball game. I, if I can prevent, I mean, sometimes I know you just you don't have a choice, but but I want I want to save timeouts. I want timeouts for late in a game. On the other hand, as you saw in, a, in one of the scenarios, is I could roll a uh, roll a, a, a six and have no timeouts. Well, you know, so how are you going to function in that situation? And so it's real important. To, we had a ball game. Uh, um, Gosh, I was doing an interim coaching job at University of Colorado, Colorado Springs, and, and we were playing against the conference champion. We were in double overtime, and we had a, but before we got there, and a regulation, we were down a couple of points with about eight seconds to go, and the opponent had the ball, and uh, we only had five fouls. And so we couldn't even get them into the bonus. It didn't look like, but the ball was on the sideline, and, and so we had instructed our kids. What I told our kids is that you foul them before they ever throw that ball in bounds. Because that ball comes in bounds, time's going to run off that clock. And clock is our enemy, not the opponent right now. And so we made sure that they knew how to foul before the clock ever ran. And we got three fouls in a row before the ball was ever inbounded and sent them to the free throw line, and they missed. We came down, scored. Anyway, we ended up winning double overtime. But if we hadn't, you know, if, if I didn't know how to how to uh, function in that situation, um, you know, the other team would have, I think, you know, would have won the, the game pretty easily. Um, so anyway, uh, uh, timeouts. Uh, then we need to know who to foul, and, and we need and we know how to foul. Uh, we have a term we use, we call red dog. And if I call it red dog, it means we want an intentional foul, but we don't want it to look like an intentional foul. The worst thing you can do is, is and we also don't want to holler foul, foul, foul number 32. And then they foul him, and, and, and the referee calls an intentional foul, and you ask him how come, and he says, well, coach, you're telling him to foul. All right, so we're going to go aggressively for the ball, and about, you know, one out of 20 times, we, we might actually separate them from the ball and no foul call. We're going to go aggressively for the ball in that situation. All right, and so I'd say, Red Dog 32. Then, they, you know, they would know we're going to foul that particular player. If you need to foul a, a player, I'm just going to talk about a couple scenarios here. You need to foul a player that, that is a real bad free thrower. Uh, what we do is that, uh, uh, you know, let's say I'm that bad free thrower and you're guarding me. All right, I'm the bad free thrower. So what I would want you to do is I want you, you're guarding me, I want you to go trap the ball handler. Well, now you've left me, the bad free thrower, open. They throw the ball to me, and now you come back and foul me. You know, so examples, you know, situations like that. Um, so you need lead protection strategy. Um, again, uh, you know, uh, if you're, you've got a lead, uh, the clock becomes your opponent here again, uh, not the team that you're playing. You know, do you have a delay game? Do you have a spread game? We do. We, you know, and, and I don't know. If you, some high schools have shot clocks, some don't. Colleges all have them, so you, you can't uh, hold the ball forever, but you can certainly uh, run, some, you know, run some time off the clock. Uh, are you going to, you know, do you want ball handlers and free throw shooters in at the end if you're in lead protection? Uh, do you want to get into substituting, uh, you know, on, on foul situations, dead balls? You want to, you know, do you want to consider getting into substituting a defender or a rebounder in uh, for a kid that maybe is not so good? And then in the next dead ball, you get the you, you get the good ball handler shooter back into that situation. So you need to take all those things into consideration. Obviously, in other scenarios, the score is tied. How are you going to handle that? Um, then uh, last second, you know, the, the, the final thing we get into is last second plays. Again, we, 
We tell our players they don't guarantee victory, but they guarantee, guarantee a chance at victory. And I think that's, that's so important. Uh, I remember being, uh, when I was at the University of Utah as an assistant coach, I remember being at a, at a game that I was scouting. We used to do live scouting in those days. And, and uh, here was a nationally ranked team that I was scouting. They were down two with three seconds to go, and they had the, the full 94 feet to go. You know, they'd go all the way to the other end to try to get a score. And here was their last second play. They inbounded it to a, a guard who was still 85 feet from the basket, and he turned and threw an 85-foot pat or shot at the basket. And I just thought to myself, you, you got to be kidding me. This is a nationally ranked team, and that's the best that they could come up with was an 85-foot heave for their last second play. So I want to get into, uh, there's a couple of last second plays. I've got several, but I just want to do a couple of them for you here to give you an idea of some things that, that, you know, that we did. And I'm going to start off with that first one we call the 94 foot play. You've heard me talk about it already. Okay, so here's the scenario. Um, you're going to have a kid down here who's going to uh, be uh, inbounding the ball. Okay, and up at the other end, actually the the uh, basic idea for this probably came from the last second play that the uh, Soviets used to, to beat the United States. Uh, they had to do it three times to do it, if you know anything about the history of the 1972 uh, uh, Munich Olympics. But anyway, they threw a long full court pass and scored uh, at the buzzer to beat the U.S. So anyway, so here's what we're going to do. Uh, I've got two uh, pretty good rebounders. Uh, on, on, uh, excuse me, I'm going to start one on the uh, uh, free throw line right behind him. I'm going to darken that guy right here. So i got a four-person stack, all right? And so here's what's going to happen in this situation. Now, my target guy is, my target guy is the, uh, the uh, uh, blackened out uh, player right here on this situation. So here's what's going to happen. Come back down here. As the referee is delivering the ball, to our inbounder. Now, sometimes that's with a bounce pass, sometimes it's with a handoff, all right? But as he is uh, delivering the, the basketball to that guy, at the other end, here's what's happening, all right? On that handoff, on the act of the handoff, on the act of the bounce, the first person in the stack begins a sprint to his right going toward the far sideline. The second person on that handoff, on handoff to, uh, by the referee uh, or the bounce pass, the second person goes to his left, sprinting toward the sideline. The fourth player in the stack is going to choose to go right or left around the uh, darkened player right there and come to an area above the top of the circle. The reason he does this, I'll talk about his role right here, in case the pass is short, he would be able to, you know, to go get the ball. All right? Now, um, the guy that, that we're targeting again is this guy right here. So what we're going to do is that my inbounder is now going to throw a, as high a pass as he can. He's going to throw a real high pass and try to drop it on this guy right here. Okay, that's that you know that's that's uh, the, the objective. But again, that's a long pass and it's hard to be accurate, right? So here are the situations that you need to be aware of. And by the way, we tell any of these players down here. This is real important to tell them this. Okay? It's real important to tell them this, is that catch, no matter what you do, catch the ball first. Catch the ball first. Because we've had situations, fortunately, in practice, where a kid was trying, you know, it's two seconds to go, and, and he, you know, he just doesn't understand the amount of time. That, that's a lifetime, really, in the game of basketball. He doesn't understand how much time that is, and he rushes and fumbles, the, fumbles that pass. All right? Anyway, this fourth kid in the stack comes up here. In case the pass is short, he's there. But again, you adjust. That pass isn't going to come directly to him if it's short. It may be, you know, it may be over here. It may be over here. So you come into that area, and then you go compete for it. Same thing with this kid. He, he's going to have to move probably to be able to compete for it. But now let's go one step further. All right, coming back here. We talked about uh, what the, if these two players are going to break right and left toward the sideline, sprint toward the sideline on the referee's delivery of the ball. Now here's the next part. When the ball is clearly out of the hands of our inbounder down here, when it's clearly out of his hands, you know, they can see it's, there's air between uh, the ball and, and that guy's hands, 
they turn now and sprint to the corner of the board. These two guys sprint, okay, to the corner of the board. And they're looking, they're, they want to be aware of this in case the pass is long. And that's happened on more than one occasion that the pass was, this kid was all uh, geeked up down here, with adrenaline and everything else, and, and, and throws the pass and it sails over the head of our intended target right there. And one of these kids is able to go in and, and get the ball. In fact, I mentioned that uh, Western New Mexico University game where a kid could have dribbled out the clock and, and, and uh, lost the ball off his foot and we had two seconds left to go. We throw a 94-foot play and we, we, the, play is, the, the pass is so long, this kid's clear down here, catches it as he's falling out of bounds, shovels it across to this kid who lays it in at the buzzer. All right? So again, ball's in the air and now if it's anywhere around our intended target, he's going to go up for that thing, compete. I tell him, compete for it like it's a rebound. And the other thing, and, and here's the thing I tell our players. It's really interesting. Here's what I tell our players. This play never works in practice, always works in a game. And, I mean, I'm telling you, that's, that is exactly how it works. And one of the things in your favor is that the last thing that the, you're coming out, if you're coming out of a timeout, the last thing that, that uh, these players are thinking as they come down these here is I don't want to foul anybody. I don't want to foul anybody on this. And so you'd be surprised how easy it is to actually complete this pass. All right, so this is a play with I got two or three seconds to go, and uh, we're going to go the, the full length of the court. And I can't, I, I, when I was a high school coach, we ran this play, and this is a true story. In one week, our freshmen, JVs, and varsity all won in the same week on the 94 foot play. So uh, again, it's, it's, it's a play that. Uh, uh, it, it, it's amazing, uh, uh, you know, the, the positives you can get out of this thing. Okay, so now one other, one other play, and uh, I'm just going to flip this around right now. And uh, this play is called our seven-second play. All right? In the seven-second play, here's the deal. Um, this play takes about six seconds to unfold, you know, from the time the ball is going to go. The ball is going to go through the basket if we make the shot, and we all and, and we almost always do. Uh, if if we uh, uh, we're going to, it's going to take six seconds uh, for this play to uh, for us to put that shot up, or actually, you know, come through the net, which gives us enough time in case we would miss this. And I think back, we have, we've never not uh, scored on this play, uh, and. Uh, it's a play that I save for, I mean, it's just, you know, got to win, got to have it. It's the only time we, we, you know, that we break it out, all right? Uh, but anyway, if we'd happen to miss it, it gives us a second for a possible tip-in. If not, we're going to overtime. We've left no time for our opponent. If we score, we leave almost no time for our opponent to have any kind of a counter play to come back and, and uh, get back into the ball game. So here's how sec seven-second play works, all right? At the seven-second mark, we're going to begin a bench countdown, and, and it's important that your players understand it has to be an accurate countdown. You know, sometimes fans will count down at the end of the game. It's 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, they all cheer, and then a second and a half later, the buzzer goes off because they get excited. It has to be an accurate countdown. Here's something else to consider. The, you know, score clocks have the tenths of a second, and so when that, when that clock first flips, Think about this. I'm counting down from 10, 9, 8, 7. Okay, the instant that I see 7 on there, it actually is, is at 7.9 seconds. All right, so you need to be, you know, be aware of that, to, uh, that part of it also. All right, so we're on an accurate countdown. All right, this kid right here is going to be facing in that direction. He's going to be facing the baseline. He's going to have his back to the point guard in this situation. Now, the point guard's dribbling the ball out, whatever he's doing to occupy to help run this time down. All right, but at seven seconds, here's what's going to happen. All right, at seven seconds, so 10, 9, 8, 7. This kid who, by facing the baseline, looks like he's going to set a screen for somebody. You know, he, didn't, he has his back, not even looking at the basketball. When we hear seven, he's going to pop out right to here, and we're going to deliver the basketball to him. On seven, this player sprints into this corner. He's a decoy, okay, but he's going to sprint into that corner. All right, so we make this pass. A point guard is going to start coming down to screen for this kid right here. 
And as he's coming down, he's going, Bill, Bill, use, use my screen. Just to kind of sell that thing. This kid is looking only at the eyes of his defender, only looking at the head of his defender. That's all he's looking at, all right, as this kid's approaching him. He'll take a step, or at any time he sees this kid turn and look at the screen, anything that, uh, that, that makes it look like this guy's ready to move in that direction, move in that direction, or look in that direction, this kid back doors right here. Now, this area's been cleared out. Remember, there, we had a guy here, but he's over in the corner right now. So this whole side, this kid's got the ball. So this defender's going to be locked up on this low post guy right in here. All right? And this kid is going to, he doesn't want his guy to, you know, to, to score the winning basket, so he's going to fight that screen. You go back door. And I got this, uh, actually, uh, this is an old play that Dean Smith used at North Carolina years and years ago. He used it as part of his offense. And if he couldn't get the backdoor lob, which they got a lot, uh, because if the defense got back and got in position, this kid was spin and pin. But we don't have time for that. And again, we haven't shown this at all. And uh, I mean, every time we've used this, we've gotten a layup. Now, let me show you something here real quick. Just to share with you. We used to keep scrap, make scrapbooks uh, for our players uh, out of all the newspaper articles. We'd have our managers copy these every time there was a... Uh, uh, a game write up and then we'd put it into a scrapbook form. But I want to read uh, something real quick from this uh, this uh, scrapbook. And this is a this is a season where we had to win. We had to beat the first and or, or, there were three of us in a three way tie for the conference championship in this particular year. And uh, we had to beat the the other two teams uh, with our seven second play uh, in the in the. Uh, second uh, weekend from the end of the season and the final game of the regular season. I want to read a quote from one of our kids. It says, Mavs fly higher than the Eagles. Um, so it says here, uh, after we ran our seven second play, one by two points, Bill Cappell says, that play works every time. He says, it's worked all year long. What are we, three for three now? Tom Cook made another great pass. Uh, everybody has to sell their part. We sold it and it worked. All right, so again, we ran it three times that year, won three games. Uh, with uh, uh, you know that seven second play so we've got other plays uh, uh, that might be a future uh, YouTube video uh, but uh, that just kind of gives you an idea of some of the things uh, you know that we do again I, I said before doesn't uh, uh, doesn't guarantee victory but it guarantees us a chance at victory and I think that's really important uh, again uh, uh, I, I just think this is a critical part of our success uh, and if you know, if you want to uh, turn a season around, if you want to start winning close games and, and bumping that record up higher and higher, I heartily encourage you to spend uh, some time every day in your practice on time and score.